Welcome to the Managing Violence Podcast, helping to make community safer by providing education in how to prevent, prepare, respond, and recover from violence in all its forms. Your host is an expert in violence and aggression management. Here is Joe Saunders. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Managing Violence Podcast, Season 3, Episode 5. We are back with a tremendous guest, as always. Today, I'm joined by James Hamilton, who is the Senior Vice President, uh, Quality and Protection for Gavin De Becker and Associates. Yes, the firm that is run by the legendary Gavin De Becker, the author of The Gift of Fear, which is probably the most recommended book on violence and uh, prevention of violence ever written. Uh, Gavin De Becker and Associates is his protection firm. James has been working for Gavin De Becker and Associates for nearly five years now. Prior to that, he had a 23-year career in law enforcement. Uh, 18 years of that spent in the FBI. Uh, while in the FBI, he was an instructor in the Overseas Survival Awareness Program, which trained uh, FBI operatives and also their families that were looking to serve overseas. Uh, he was also part of the protective security detail for the FBI uh, and trained protective security agents for the FBI, both domestically and internationally. He was also an FBI SWAT team member. So uh, James has a wealth of experience, obviously, when it comes to dealing with violence and training other people to prepare for violence at the highest levels. So it was a great, it was a great opportunity to pick his brain and just to have a conversation with a like-minded professional. Uh, we had a lot of fun talking to each other, and uh, I'm not going to get too far into the preamble because uh, look, you you need to listen to James and he needs to be the star of this show. So I uh, highly encourage you to listen to this episode. There's a lot of great nuggets of information uh, and it was a lot of fun. Without further ado, here is James Hamilton from Gavin De Becker and Associates. Thanks for joining us, James. So it's great to have you here. A tremendous honor to have someone of your your credibility and your uh, your work history here on the podcast. So thanks for making the time. Of course, and thank you for that. That's very, very flattering and probably not deserving, but thank you very much. I'm glad to be with you. That's great. Uh, look, for, for those listeners that, that may not be familiar with you, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are familiar with your, the company you're currently working for, Gavin De Becker and Associates, or at least uh, Gavin De Becker's work and his, his published works. But can we give a, give it, get a bit of an introduction to who you are and, uh, and your journey into this field? And uh, I guess probably your what what gets you up in the morning? What do you enjoy doing? And what is it about this industry that you love? Sure. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm a senior vice president in Gavin DeBecker and Associates. We are a executive protection firm based in Los Angeles, California. Uh, our bread and butter is personal protection or close protection for high net worth individuals and families and corporations. Um, we also uh, kind of pioneered the threat assessment management business. Uh, Gavin started in the industry about 40 years ago. Uh, it, he just was really um, kind of a, well, he is a pioneer of, you know, new techniques, new strategies. Um, and any, I had uh, heard of him. I was an FBI agent for uh, 17 years. I was a police officer before that. But as an FBI agent, I was heavily involved in protection and protecting different uh, individuals in the U.S. government. Uh, and then I got involved on the training side, uh, and, and we were providing a book to all of our overseas travelers, and the book was called The Gift of Fear by Gavin DeBecker, which was a great book. It was fantastic. I read it a, a couple of times. And anyway, I, I didn't know that he had a protection firm. I just thought he was an author. And, and then someone told me to read another book called Just Two Seconds, which is really what I call the protection Bible or a close yeah, protection a, operators Bible. It's and, absolutely and we, another, another great read. Uh, I think uh, if you're, if you're involved in protecting anybody, it's a, it's a necessary read. Yes, sir. The thing about that book that was very good was it was data driven. It wasn't theory or um, someone's you know cool idea. And then he was trying to support it. It was, it was data driven information about the study of 1400 attacks on protected people and, and kind of what was going on. And first of all, how quick it happens. And then, you know, the time and distance are really the most important things in, in all of it. 
Um, anyway, it really got me kind of doing a lot of self-reflection because I had done protection for a very, very long time with a very, very uh, highly skilled unit. And I didn't know any of this stuff, frankly. Uh, I knew a little bit of it, but I didn't know it the way Gavin and, and, and the other authors were explaining it. And so I read the book and I was like very interested. And I started, uh, I created a, a school for the FBI where we train protection uh, agents and I used some of Gavin's drills there in the book. Um, I used the time and distance drills specifically. And um, one of the individuals from the company, uh, I think it was even Gavin, found out about it. And he asked me you know, if I was doing that. And I said, yes, sir. And then we started a, a real great conversation. Um, and that led, you know, one thing led to another. And um, I joined the firm four years ago and uh, really have never looked back. Um, you, you asked the beginning, you know, what, what kind of motivates me or gets me up my uh my my thing that i i ask people a lot and i got this from grant cardone i said hey you know what what would you do for nothing right what would you do for no money and and my answer to that is i would help people protect themselves for no money um that's what gets me up in the morning that's what keeps me up at night and that's what i do and and i and i would do it for nothing i mean I, i'm paid obviously to do what i do but I love it that much. So that's, that's what I do for nothing. And that's protecting individuals kind of to get past this, you know, this mysticism, if you will, of safety and personal security awareness and really just help them um, save their, their own lives. Yeah. I, I think that that level of passion and commitment and, uh, and I guess internal drive and, and sense of uh, purpose is, is necessary to have the longevity that, that you've had in this industry. I mean, the uh, the shine of protection wear, wears off pretty quickly if you think it's yes. going to be all uh, fancy cars and and fancy parties. Uh, so soon enough, you get slapped in the face with reality, and you have to figure out if you actually care about what you're doing or not. Yeah. And those people that are listening, I'm so sorry, my dog's losing his mind. That's okay. <laughs> those people that are listening right now that that actually do protection, um, you know what I call a protector. I just, my hat's off to them because like you said, Joe, it is such a hard job and there's people out there. They've been in the business 20, 30 years, you know, their feet and their back are hurting. And I just, I have all the respect in the world for them because they're doing it. They're doing it every single day and they're, they're committed to something other than themselves. I mean, there's some real nobility into this work. Believe me, I, I believe in all of that. Um, Cause you don't, it is, um, you know, it is not within our DNA to be unselfish. And that's what a protector is. He's living someone else's life or she is living someone else's life. And, and that's an unselfish act. And so I give them all the respect and the credit, believe me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's something that uh, I guess the general public are, are oblivious to is that the, those who dedicate themselves to protecting others, they, they essentially are sacrificing so much of their own personal experiences and their own family time and their own holidays to be able to essentially be at the beck and call of someone else and, and to care for someone else's needs as a priority. And the, the drain that, that uh, has on someone's individual life is, uh, is incredible and can't be overstated. So I think those that are able to maintain that for an extended period of time, um, they really are drawn as a, as a protector by, by instinct, I think more so than, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. It, there's a lot of easier ways to make a living. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, for sure. And so, and so sometimes the money isn't the motivator too. <laughs> I've yeah. worked on a couple of protection jobs where you think I, I really could be getting paid a lot better to do something a lot easier. But uh, <laughs> that's for sure. And then there's right, some so, jobs. There's some jobs I, I've said that, you know that I would pay somebody to do it. You know, like I've been on some assignments, especially when I was with the FBI, where I would have paid you to do what I was doing. Yeah, it was that amazing. Um, so you see it both. You see the amazing things and you also have, you know, those terrible days. Um, it balances out, I think. Yeah, I, I distinctly recall uh, doing a 14-hour shift in a closet that uh, <laughs> they literally joined two rooms that had, uh, it, was a, it was a private exhibition for a major contract and uh, the two exhibitors were uh, in two separate rooms and couldn't be... Uh, couldn't have any access to each other's uh, presentations before time and uh, there was a closet that joined them and as a young 
agent, I was placed in the closet for 14 hours. <laughs> mm, that's so, I, I like to think now we might have, uh, I don't know, locked the doors or <laughs> done something a little bit different. But uh, Use technology was, uh, or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm still not convinced it wasn't a rib. But anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, so what uh, what uh, I think just talking before we uh, we started the show, I think what would be a really good topic for us to dive into is uh, is pre incident indicators uh, and, and some of the material that, as you mentioned, the the gift of fear is such a, a pioneering work uh, in this field of violence prevention. Uh, and, I, and realistically, I mean, I became exposed to the gift of fear long after it was written, but it was early in my career, and. Uh, I'd never read anything like it before. Everything I'd read in violence management or uh, self-defense or personal safety was was very geared towards the uh, the during phase or the like the immediate just before you get punched in the face. Here's what you need to look for. Whereas um, Gavin's work was was very much in the uh, establishing that the violence is usually a, the the continuation of a relationship in a way, and uh, being able to identify that relationship early, whether it's whether it is an intimate relationship or whether it's just a prolonged contact or whether it's a stalker or, or whatever it is, but there's, there's usually some very early warning signs. So it'd be great to talk about that and, and what you guys go through to, to educate your clients. Yeah. The very first thing we always talk about and, and Gavin of course talks about it uh, is this thing called intuition and it is an early radar, if you will, that is within you. It's in your DNA. You have it. And, you know, people would pay good money for that type of skill or um, not skill, but that ability in any other part of their life, they would pay to know what's going to happen. Uh, they pay for GPS, they pay for other you know, types of technologies. But when it comes to themselves, a lot of people hate their intuition. They hate that they're that way. You'll hear them say things like, I don't want to be that way. Um, you'll hear people say, I don't want to be judgmental. You'll hear people say, uh, I just can't think that way. Well, these are all denials of their intuition. I always say when I speak publicly is that the denial is the enemy of intuition and humans do it. Okay. Animals don't do it. And Gavin talks a lot about this in the book. An animal would not walk in the savanna. A gazelle would not look at a lion and go, oh, it's probably nothing. Right. The gazelle would say, that lion will eat me. I'm getting the hell away from it. And he does. Yeah, they, they, they don't question that judgment. And I think uh, this is something that I talk about a little bit when, when we're teaching about intuition as well as, you know, this, uh, this whole idea of typecasting or um, you know, stereotyping individuals serves a purpose because uh, 10,000 years ago, walking across the savannah of the last thing that was big and furry and had claws tried to kill me, I probably don't have to introduce myself to the next thing that looks like that. Yeah, I'm quite, quite, quite uh, well within my rights to just run. Yeah, that's that's the reason why the modern age has really, um, really suffered, if you will, is because there's there's less accountability, right? And that's why these active shooter events, especially in the U.S., are so traumatic. Is because people are like, I can't believe this is happening in a civilized society. Blah blah blah. Well, um, there used to be real accountability for you when you went out, you know, when you left the, your confines of, of your civilization, your tribe, wherever you were living, and you went out there to get food or, or whatever you're doing, there was real accountability, right? If you were not paying attention and you weren't listening to your intuition and listening to what the, you know, everything that's going on around you, you could die out there. And so, you know, there was high likelihood, high consequence. Today, we have low likelihood, high consequence. I mean, it's probably not going to happen, but man, when it does, it's bad and it's awful. Um, and, and that's unfortunately the, the thing I fight against daily when I'm teaching people is like, listen, culture has, has told you, you know, don't be judgmental, don't do these things, blah, blah, blah. And it's really telling you to deny your intuition. And please hear me, I'm not telling people to judge anybody. I'm just saying, listen to your intuition that helps you make an assessment about your environment. That's it. It's not my job to judge anybody, but I'll make an assessment about a situation and say, I don't want to go in there or I want to be away from that guy or that girl or those guys. I want to get away from that. Right. Um, that's my intuition. That's situational awareness, all these other things that people talk about. Um, and I do that daily and I'm trying to get people, you know, to buy in. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think it's just, it's recognizing it as another data point. I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to flee or you have to necessarily <laughs> yeah, pre preemptively uh, knock someone out because they, they give you they give you the creeps, but it's another data point that allows you to, to enact other layers of defense or to be able to position yourself better or to be able to just have a, an extra level of awareness or uh, uh, assertiveness when dealing with it with an individual if you if you feel there might be something going on so uh, that's right. I think yeah uh, but it, what you say is interesting about the the level of denial and, and accountability for safety because one of the things that we teach uh, a lot with our uh, especially with our corporate clients is uh, looking at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and and the bottom two layers uh, you know the, the, the sense of, of safety and survival I mean that Really, if you live in a first world country, we don't deal with threats to our safety and survival uh, on a regular basis. And be because of that, we, we have no resiliency built at that level. And okay. we see that in, uh, in first world countries, when, when things like active shooter events happen or even natural disasters happen, we fall apart. We, we, we lose the ability to function because we haven't built any resiliency at that level. We've been so focused on the self-actualization and the loving and belonging and the relationships and, and all that kind of thing that uh, we, we really don't have the ability to, to function as well as we could. Whereas sometimes you take someone who's lived in a third world country where they are very aware of their safety and survival and starving to death is a realistic possibility if you lose your job and uh, that uh, you, know, you may get murdered if you walk into the wrong area, that uh, they tend to have a greater degree of resilience when these things happen because they've built it over years of exposure. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. The, uh, especially like here in the States, you know, I used to train FBI agents and we used to always ask them this question, how many of you have been in a fist fight? And, you know, the numbers kept getting lower and lower and lower every year. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, that I'm a pugilist or something, but there, um, when, when you've never been in a fight, you don't understand violence at that level. Um, it does, you know, it, it, it'll shock you and or scare you. And it'll actually delay your decision making, which is is what you see a lot in the U.S. on some of these you know these shootings. Yeah, I also think that um, people that have been punched in the mouth growing up tend to be more polite as adults. But <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's right. possibly a topic for another day. <laughs> so, that's right. That's good. Yeah. The, the other thing uh, to your question about you know pre incident indicators. The the other thing is that. In the book, and one of the things Gavin talks a lot about is that, you know, unfortunately, you know, in that book, especially a lot of the victims were, were female, um, and, and they'll say something like, I didn't want to be rude, right? The guy was creepy, or my intuition said he, there's something strange about him, but I didn't want to be rude, right? And Gavin always says, you know, he's never assessed a case where an individual was victimized because they were rude. But he's assessed, you know, thousands of cases where the individual was victimized because they were too nice. And, and, you know, what I teach my wife and my daughter is that if, you know, you're in a parking lot of a, of a box store, like a Walmart, I don't know what y'all have down there. But, you know, uh, if you're in a w parking lot and some guy is, you know, kind of scoping you out and you notice that and then he makes an approach, you know, the, the answer is no. Right. Like, I don't want your help. I don't need your help. Leave me alone and get away from me um, instead of, you know, trying to be, you know, super kind, uh, especially to someone in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, target hardening or, or making yourself a, le a less attractive victim is, is one of the, the major things that uh, everybody needs to learn because, because at the end of the day, you know, I use the analogy that if you're, you and your friend are running from a bear, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than your friend. So right. as, as long as you are a less attractive victim than someone else, you're probably okay. Right. Like if you took, and I was, I used the dark parking lot scenario, you know, if, if you're walking to your car alone and you, you know, have your head down, maybe looking at a phone or worse yet, you're looking at a phone with your earbuds in, you know, you're obviously projecting someone who's not strong and not vigilant and not looking around. Though you may be all of those things, you may be strong and everything else, but you're just not vigilant. And so to a bad guy, you're, you look like, okay, that could be easy. But if you're walking to your car with your phone in your pocket and your flashlight in your hand and you shine like underneath your car, as I teach my daughter to do, and someone sees that, they're like, wow, this, this person's like 
they're in it. They're aware. They're paying attention. It's going to be difficult for me to approach them, right? They'll probably go the other way, unless this is some specific stalking situation, which that would be a different story. Um, but if it's the run of the mill random violence, you know, then I, my, my experience is, is that that individual will choose someone else. He will go somewhere else because he doesn't want to deal with it. Yeah, uh, look, a, a large part of what I end up teaching at the moment is is verbal de-escalation. And I, and I think one of the caveats that I always put on verbal de-escalation training is that de-escalation is great for social violence, where it's, it's something that has been uh, the result of some sort of communication or some sort of interaction. Uh, but predatory violence, the, the de-escalation phase is really what you do to not make yourself a victim in the first place. Once someone has right. decided that you're a victim, it's very hard to de-escalate that. The only thing you that's can then right. do is to essentially fight, whether that's verbally causing a scene, making noise, whatever. Uh, but you're not going to de-escalate someone who has, who has uh, chosen you as a cold-blooded victim. Uh, but I think what you're saying there about just making yourself a less attractive target is, uh, <coughs> is, is key. Absolutely. And, and don't get into that situation. You know, like I had a client want me to teach them how to get out of a trunk from, uh, you know, handcuffs or duct tape. And I'm like, whoa, 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 let's, let's, let's not get in a trunk, right? Let's do everything we can. Then. <laughs> how do we not get there in the first place? <laughs> exactly right. You know, uh, a friend of mine is Tony Blower and Tony always says, you know, this isn't Star Trek. These guys aren't beaming themselves into your spot and they just show up, you know, it, what people miss is what I call the approach. You know, the bad guy is coming. We're just not looking, right? Or we're seeing it and we're going, oh, it's probably nothing, which is denial of intuition. Uh, and then, unfortunately, it's too late, right? And uh, I, I don't know about you, Joe, but it is very, very difficult for you to stand behind me, okay? Like, I can't, ima I can't remember the last time I let someone stand behind me. Yeah, and I, I think we, we build that level of awareness and uh, and I think we, we try intuition is something that can be trained as well. I, I think that's probably another piece that people miss is that your, your intuition is is instinctive, but you can equip it and you can you can you can uh, put some aftermarket accessories on it to, sure. to make it to make it a little work a little bit better. And I think part of that, it's like those of us that um, uh, I always joke about if I'm having lunch with a you know, someone else who's, who's worked in protection or a similar field that uh, uh, it's sort of a race to see who gets the prime position when we sit down uh, and who has oh, to yeah. have their, who has to have their back to the door. Cause you can, you can physically make them uncomfortable the entire time that you're talking just by making That's them right. sit, <laughs> making them choose between etiquette or, or safety. But uh, and you know, yeah. you know, you'll ask him when you sit down, like you got my back and he's like, what? And then you say, okay, switch. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, I, I, I do this all the time with my boss who uh, has a long uh, executive protection background in South Africa. And uh, yeah, we, we play this game with each other quite a bit just to, uh, just to, just to get on each other's nerves a little bit. But uh, uh, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about switching people on. Um, th this is something that, uh, that we face a lot here in Australia. We have been insulated from major violence. Um, Mostly, I mean, we've had a, we've had a few exceptions here and there, but generally speaking, it's a peaceful country. We haven't had major terrorism events. We've had a couple of lone actors that have, yeah, uh, certainly not undermining the tragedy of, of any life that's taken. But we haven't had a nine eleven. We haven't had a major explosion. Uh, we we haven't had you know, mass casualty events, uh, and because of that, it's it's actually quite difficult for those of us in this field to connect people with the reality and the and the re and what the actual risk is. Uh, and, and sadly, sometimes we sort of resign ourselves to, well, you know, we've, we've done all we can. We just have to wait for something to happen now for people to get it. Uh, and I was just wondering if, if you guys have, uh, obviously working with some clients, you have some clients that are, that are more aware of their safety than others. Uh, and how you go about having those conversations? Well, the people that I've met that have a higher level of awareness either lived the life or were victims previously. Um, something has happened to them and, and they're, you know, obviously not going to be a victim again, or, you know, they're very, very vigilant and very, very aware. Um, the, the one thing I say a lot is that risk is mitigated and never eliminated. And, you know, we can never get rid of risk and, and this whole thing about, you know, safety, the safety is kind of an illusion. You know, you're, you're, you're making things more safe or less, you know, your actions could be less safe, but we're mitigating things here. And, and one of those keys to mitigation is awareness. That's the very first thing. It is, you know, 
being aware and listening to the intuition of, of your environment. And what I always tell people when I get finished training them is that I always pray for, vid, for, you know, for energy. Why? Because you know what happens. If you've done this at all, you'll train a group and they'll be ready to go. They'll be meat eaters. They'll be ready to walk out of that room and do their thing. But if you come back in six months or nine months, their vigilance will come down exponentially. Why? Because nothing's happened, right? It's that low likelihood, high consequence. They haven't had a chance to use those skills. They haven't been uh, victimized, all of it. Uh, and, and what I always say is I'm praying for your energy because this is hard, right? This is hard work because you have to do it every day and it may never happen, right? It's like I used to train FBI agents. Like you may never be in a gunfight, but you might be in one, your very first arrest. No one knows, right? No one, there's no magic sauce or no um, crystal ball that'll tell us which agent's going to be in a, in, a, in a gunfight. So you have to prepare as though it's going to happen your first day, but it may never happen your whole career. And that's why I pray for energy. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, people can take it or they can leave it. Um, it. We can't make them do it, right? Because, again, we're living in a situation where it's low likelihood, high consequence. Yeah, that's a really valid point. And there's something that I, I refer to sometimes called vigilance fatigue. Uh, and I, I sort of extrapolated this from uh, the Cooper Color Codes of yeah, alertness yeah. and awareness and so on. Uh, and those who uh, spend too much time in, in orange or red uh, tend to burn out pretty quickly uh, because it's, you just can't maintain that level of, of hyper alertness, and nor should you uh, in your day-to-day -day life. And I, I think you can extrapolate that into days at a time or weeks or months even where you have someone who's come out of a, you know, a basic training or an academy or some sort, or even just a, a very good um, personal safety or self-defense seminar and, for the next week, they're, they're looking around every corner and they're doing everything perfectly right and they're putting a lot of mental energy into their vigilance and then nothing happens and it becomes yeah. fatiguing to stay at that level. And I think it's important for us to be aware that when we're training people to be vigilant and, uh, and to be alert, that we're also training them to get on with the rest of their lives as well and, and putting things in the proper threat context for who that individual is and what they're, what they're actually going to be exposed to. Yeah, it's so funny because I, I use Cooper also, and I've been using it for for a very, very long time. And 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 you know, it's it's interesting talking to you because we're we're almost like the same person. We just live in different continents. Um, when I teach Cooper, what I always say is, um, and and for your listeners, they should really look up you know Jeff Cooper's color code system. But what I always teach them is that yellow, white, yellow, orange, and red. That white, you know, obviously is when we're completely switched off sleeping. But the yellow, orange, and red um, that I use them as a scale and that yellow is kind of, I start my day and then orange is kind of, I'm leaning into something. I'm thinking something's going to happen. And then red is fights on or flight is on F L I G H T, which to me is the same thing as fighting, but you can only do red for a certain period of time because of the heart rate and everything else that's happening to your body. And I tell people all the time, you know, you can't be red all the time. And invariably there's going to be some SWAT person out there and you know, I've shown that slide to, and he's like, I'm red all the time, man. I'm like, well, you're an idiot because you can't sustain red forever. Right. That's why boxers have to rest after three minutes. They don't keep going. They got to take a break and, and same thing. So I, I always like to have people use the color code sparing or use it, um, you know, to conserve energy. And, you know, you don't have to be red in your living room. Right. If you're red, yeah, you, you certainly you, shouldn't be. You're not going to have many friends, right? Maybe I need to come do an assessment at your house. Like, what's going on with you? Yeah, yeah. Well, you need to you need to change the neighborhoods if you're in red in your living room. But <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a yeah personal safety one on one. Don't be where the bad stuff happens. But yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, actually, interesting. You, you might uh, you might find this research interesting. We we borrowed this from sports uh, sports psychology. There was a, uh, a research project done a, a number of years ago on cricket players. Uh, I know you're probably, probably not overly familiar with cricket, but uh, the, uh, the study was on the best batsmen, so the, the best you know, batters in, in cricket. And uh, what, one of the things that differentiates cricket from baseball is that a, a cricket batsman may be at the crease or maybe up for several hours at a time. And uh, they, they went through a variety of um, assessment tools on these, these batsmen to see who, who could, uh, you know, what, was the, what was the key variable that made someone successful or not at the highest level. 
and they expected it to be something physiological like strength or lever length or any, something like that. But what they actually found was the, the one key variable that was consistent was the ability to ration focus and their, their ability to switch on that code red as such for just a couple of seconds when the ball was coming towards them to be able to read it, play their shot and then move on and then switch back to a yellow to be able to ration that level of alertness over a period of several hours. Whereas those who couldn't ration it and switch it on and off, they fatigued and they, they would usually make a mistake within the first you know, half an hour to an hour at the crease because their, their level of alertness was exhausted. And uh, their theory that came out of that is that each human being has about 20 minutes of laser focus a day. So if you burn through that in the first 20 minutes of your day, then you are basically subpar for the rest of the day. Um, I thought that was quite interesting to apply that to, uh, yeah, to what we do with Cooper. Very, very interesting. And I'm going to use that because I am familiar with cricket and the wicket and the, you yep. basically play baseball on a 360 degree field. It looks like, um, but yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, no, my, my pleasure. It's, uh, when I first learned that, I thought, man, that's, that's a really good analogy, especially here in Australia where everyone understands cricket. <laughs> but yeah. I'm not sure if I'd be able to use that in the US where I'd have to spend the first half hour introducing the game of cricket before it made any sense. <laughs> no, I think you'd, you'd be fine with it, mate. They'd love it. <laughs> sure. So, so look, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the other pre-incident indicators for, for people that maybe haven't read The Gift of Fear. Uh, we're talking about regular people here, not necessarily protectors or law enforcement agents that are concerned about their safety. What are some of the things that people should be looking out for? Um, let, let, let's, let's, let's narrow the focus a little bit or else we could be doing a three hour podcast, but um, let's, let's talk about relationships. Uh, let's, let's narrow it down to women that are dealing with um, yeah, either a new boyfriend or maybe someone who's interested in them, things they should be uh, looking at and concerned about. Oh, maybe you know obviously they had to have had an initial reaction to this individual and that was probably favorable and then you know during the course of the relationship there's a little bit of a a little bit of a hint to you know kind of going down a, a badder road which would be like uh obsessed with their location obsessed with who they're talking to uh, obsessed with um, where, where they're going or any of their actions that don't involve that person Th those are s silent little hmm that that I don't like that so much uh, references to violence uh, you know in context of men on women that would concern me um, there's a there's a really good study here in the U.S. about you know a, a guy that will put his hands around a woman's throat and, and if that happens you know that the study in the U.S. was that he's 800 percent more likely to kill her. Um, so I don't know if women realize that you know obviously any violence against them is wrong, but if he tries to strangle her, that's even worse, right? Um, so so to me those are some of the the telltale you know signs or a history of bad relationships that he won't take credit for. Right. Yeah, it's that's a, that's someone. an interesting one. Yeah, it's always it's, a, it's always the crazy ex that uh, made these wild allegations. You know, not not that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's always someone good. else's fault. You know, it, it things that you know again. It, it'll go back to oh, that's odd. You know, um, a, a text, for instance. Hey, I I noticed, you know, on your phone or your GPS that you were so and so, but you said you were so and so. Well, whoa, wait, wait a minute. How do you know where I am? You know, what, what do you mean the GPS? Like, and, and then Gavin always says that, you know, we should make, you know, slow, careful choices about the people we let in our life. And then we make fast, deliberate decisions about those we exclude, right? And unfortunately, we do this in dating or in employment where we, we hire someone really quickly or we start to date someone very, very quickly. And then we take forever to get rid of them, forever. Right, we keep you know putting it off, um, and, and and it should be the opposite. You should spend far more time assessing whether you're going to let someone into your life, and then very very quick about letting them go. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point because uh, one of the frustrations for for most small businesses and, and medium sized businesses and even large businesses here in Australia is that you can take as long as you want to hire someone. But firing them is incredibly difficult. <laughs> it's it's very very hard to fire someone here. 
um, and do it legally and correctly because uh, yeah, we've got such protection over people's rights to employment and making sure they're not unfairly dismissed and so on. And uh, that is sometimes an issue when it comes to, you know, you really need to make sure that you vet that person properly before you give them tr access to your to your uh, your workplace and your trusted data and so on, because getting rid of them can be a challenge. Uh, oh, yeah. and, uh, and I think, as you say, though, th that violates those principles of um, you know, being slow to add and quick to re quick to detract, uh, um, quick to exclude. But that's uh, right. yeah, uh, that's that's a really good point. Uh, probably something. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, probably something that uh, just to expand upon that as well. We're, we're talking before about intuition. And uh, you mentioned that we, we often have a favorable first uh, interaction. Obviously, if, we've, if a lady's ended up in a, in a relationship, there's been some sort of favorable reaction. Um, but uh, oftentimes in the, uh, the aftermath of a tragedy, the, the woman's friends will say, I knew there was something wrong with him. I knew, I knew there was a problem. She, could, she couldn't see it. And I, I try to encourage, and thankfully my daughters are quite young, so I haven't had this conversation yet, but uh, I try to encourage women to, to listen to their friends because sure, you might have one friend who thinks everybody's a loser, but if you have several friends or your mother or someone else is saying, I don't like him, get rid of him, and you can't see it, it's possible that that charm, and, and uh, I, I stole this from, from Gavin from the very beginning, charm being a, a skill, not an attribute, but uh, that charm might be focused on you, but he's not very good at charming others that he's not focused on. So um, yeah, sometimes it, your, uh, your views can be, can be clouded with, a, with an optimism bias that others aren't. So uh, I think well, that's-, that's the, the, other thing, like, the other thing is, you know, there's like force teaming, there, there's all these different things that'll happen or play the guilt trip on you or victimization, like they'll do all of these different techniques to, uh, you know, to stay in your space or stay in the relationship. I won't do it again, I promise. Uh, you know, uh, those types of things are, are really like red herrings. You know, it, it's time to go, it's time to go now. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, again, it comes back to what we, we started the conversation with, which is, which is trusting that intuition and and feeling like you know you don't need to wait for five consecutive signals that it, that it's time to go uh, because it, the the fifth one might be might be the final one where you no longer have a choice to go or not. Uh, and I think um, we also run the risk of this uh, of falling into a pattern of learned helplessness where we just accept that this is life now and this is this is the nature of my relationship and and the it, it almost becomes more attractive than the the unknown of uh, of escape. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Great. So, so let's uh, switch gears a little bit to uh, some of the work you were doing in, um, with the FBI uh, previously uh, about pre preparing agents for traveling uh, overseas uh, and doing protection details overseas. We, we mentioned earlier about you know, if you grow up in a, in a first world country where you haven't been exposed to to crisis on a regular basis, um, that it can be a bit of a culture shock. So was there any sort of key learnings you took away from that process of preparing people to walk into less stable environments? Um, one of the things I always like to say to them is you don't have to go. Okay. The easiest protection mission in the world is to not go. And, and I'd say, just stay here in one of the most dangerous countries on the planet, right? Which is America. Um, and they'd all chuckle. And, and I'd say, you know, going overseas really is not that different. We just try to avoid, you know, these situations. And the way you do that is by being prepared and, you know, obviously utilizing not just situational awareness, but being aware of, you know, the, the culture and being aware of what looks right. And it'll take you a little bit to kind of to get this. There's a great book called The Left of Bang, where they did a really good program in the Marine Corps about teaching people how to, uh, you know, understand relationships very quickly. Um, but once you kind of start to get them thinking from the terms of just, you know, okay, be aware of my environment. And then violence is violence, right? Violence is universal. It doesn't matter where you are on the planet. Human violence against another is, is very, very universal. And and then just okay, give them some real actionable you know steps to get you know to get out of that. 
um, really empowered them. It really did. And it wasn't, we tried, and what we did in that program was we tried to keep it very, very simple. Very, very simple. Stay out of the environment. If you find yourself in that environment, get the hell out of it as fast as you possibly can. And that wasn't some crazy, you know, bootlegger turn or moonshine drill on the track. It was go straight or go back and then get back to the safe haven as fast as you possibly can. Safe haven being the U.S. Embassy in most cases. Um, and, and people, you know, they got it. And, and, and it was it was great to watch because that was a, the program was really neat because we actually trained spouses who were not FBI employees, but they're their, their spouse was, and they were offered a slot in the class because they were going to be deploying overseas with their spouse. So we would train, you know, you know, non-bureau people who were housewives or um, stay-at-home dads or whatever, and we train them just as we train the agents and the analysts, and, and that was really empowering for them, and it, especially when you could get the couples together in a car, and they'd work as a team, you know, one drive, one navigate, one calm. It was very, very... Uh, very very rewarding to, to do that program yeah, that's a that's a really fascinating point about uh about bringing the spouses in because i, I think that's something that we're, we're probably uh, i won't say all of us but, but certainly a majority of us are guilty of which is having a lot of skills and abilities on our own and then having a uh an either an, an untrained or uninterested spouse or family <laughs> so we we might we might have all the all the protective skills and awareness in the in the world and then we we take a family holiday and we're still vulnerable because the other, the other members of the party uh, are switched off. Uh, so other, I think yeah, it, it, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but this is a big one. Okay. It, for oh, This was one of the biggest things I had to get over and I still have to get over with people is if you ask them, do you think you're rich? They would say no. Right. But a, a, a poor person in America is rich in the rest of the world. Right. They're loaded. If you make more than $30,000 a year, I read somewhere, you're like in the top 2% of the world or something. Um, I, you have to teach them that you, by being you know, an American overseas, they think you're rich. And it doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you're Warren Buffett or you're not. They look at you as someone who is rich. So please be prepared for you know, just regular violence targeted at you, theft, robbery, those types of things. Obviously we would give them the big prep on what to wear and not, you know, don't wear jewelry, but all, you know, expensive jewelry, all that stuff, but getting their mind around, Hey, you're an American and you always will be. Cause we, we would have a thing. I don't know if you have it down there, but we, we call it going native where you would, you would send a person to a country. And then after three years, you know, they think they're a citizen and they're talking the lingo and all of it, but they're not, they're still an American and you have to kind of tell them, Hey man, you're, an, you're still an American. Stop it. Yeah. And, and no matter how well you think you're blending in, you're, you're really not. You're always going to be that American, right? Like, yes. And, and the blending is a huge one because what I saw and still see is that Americans who deploy, they want to blend, but they want to blend with each other. They don't want to blend with the actual environment. Right. So you'll see them, you know, it. they're wearing the 511 combat cargo pants with the plaid, you know, untucked <laughs> shirt, you know, you've seen it, right? The G a G-Shock watch and some Oakley's. Yeah. yeah it's a big watch, <laughs> right? Every, it's every big covert big. operator everywhere in the world. <laughs> yeah. And they're all blending, but they're blending with each other. Right. If you just threw on a business suit and no tie, you could probably pull off that look. It will definitely anywhere in Europe, anywhere in Europe. Even in the Middle East, when I've been there, you can wear that look, right? And no one knows who the hell you are. They might yeah. think you're an American, but man, when you start running 511s and boots, you know, Merrill's or uh, Solomon boots with, you know, the, the untucked plaid shirt, they know that yeah. you're some type of, you know, government operator or whatever. You may as well be wearing a uniform. I mean, you, you yeah, essentially yeah. are. It is you, you, you're wearing the ununiform uniform. As, uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a very valid point. Stop, <laughs> stop doing that yeah uh actually quite quite interesting just about blending and some sometimes being uh being aware of what you can be mistaken as as well i, I, had, a, I had an interesting experience when i uh i was in kazakhstan in uh uh 2013 um and uh i i was interested that i was getting very weird sort of deferential service when i was going into businesses and i, I wasn't speaking 
because uh, I, I had a translator with me. Uh, and I asked them, I said, well, why are these people kind of fearful? And the answer was because I was, I was large, I was white, and I, and I had uh, expensive looking tattoos that were visible. And they assumed I was Russian mafia. Um, <laughs> I, was a, I was an Australian tourist. Uh, they, they assumed that, uh, that I was Russian and I was a gangster because the only large white guys with expensive tattoos they saw were Russian gangsters. Uh, and wow. Uh, now, wow, I and mean, that, that was a whole threat profile I was completely unaware of, of what I could be right. mistaken as. Um, it wasn't until I started trying to speak my broken Russian they realized I wasn't. But, uh, <laughs> but so, uh, yeah. yeah. It's like an armored SUV, you know, Land Cruiser or whatever. You know, a lot of times you're, you're, you're especially like in Mexico, you, you really would prefer not to be in, a, in an armored Suburban if you can help it an armored Camry or something would be probably better because you might elevate your profile to the point where they think you're a cartel or whatever. Um, and, and you could, you know, you don't want that. Uh, and that happened to some ICE agents of ours. Um, but yeah, you're right. Sometimes you can blend too well or you're, you're fitting a profile of something that you don't want to be fitting. Yeah. And I, I think that's why that, uh, that Intel piece of before you travel is so critically important because you need to understand the local sensitivities not just in terms of, of your own contact, but, uh, but how you can inadvertently uh, become associated with something you don't necessarily want to be associated with. Uh, okay. and it, you know, we see that a lot with, with Australians uh, traveling to Southeast Asia because it's, it's right here on our doorstep. Uh, but there's, al there's almost like this uh, perception of how Australians behave when they're overseas, and it's, it's, it's not great. <laughs> it's, it's, re it's really not great, especially in the party areas of you know, of, uh, you know, Patong or you know, Bali or whatever. Uh, so you kind of, you kind of don't want to be associated with that because you'll, you'll, you'll stir up some local angst uh, in the wrong places. But uh, mm. yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, just going back to the training of the spouses. Uh, one story that, uh, so my, my boss or the founder of my company, uh, Dr. Gav Schneider, he, uh, he tells a story about how he got started or uh, training people. He was, um, he was a close protection operative in South Africa. Uh, he was a martial arts champion. He had all, all the abilities of his own. Uh, and yet uh, his father-in-law was, was killed in a carjacking. And what burned him up about it was that he knew exactly what he could have done to avoid that, but he had never taught them. Uh, and he, ne he had never shared that knowledge because it was never, you know, it was never a topic of conversation. It was just that his line of work, he needed to have those skills and, uh, but living in South Africa, it was quite obvious to him in hindsight that he really should have shared that information with everybody he cared about. Uh, and I think uh, I sometimes refer to that as the the protector's burden, where uh, we train ourselves, but it's it's important that we also train those we care about. Oh, yeah. That's so good. It, I don't know about you, but so many times when you try to provide guidance to someone you care about, they don't want to listen to you. I could pull some, you know, dude off the street here and have him give the exact same information and my kid would listen to it. Um, it's so frustrating, but that, that's, a, that's a really um, strong thing you just said about that guilt because that's like survival guilt. Um, yeah. And, and when I was you know, on a protected detail for a long time, I was always worried I wouldn't be there. That was my biggest fear is I wouldn't be there. If something happened, you know, and God forbid any of the guys or the principal were, were injured that was my biggest fear was I, was I wouldn't be there. And, and I, I feel for your friend because I know that he beats himself up about it. The other thing that I'd say is you never know, and this is big for your, for your listeners, right? You don't know how someone is going to react when real violence comes, right? They can do all the training in the world and they could have thought through it. Now, I, I do believe they are better prepared to handle a situation like that if they'd at least thought of it, if they'd at least been trained to, to think about what they would do in that situation versus never have thought about it at all. As Tony would say, the default position, if you've never thought about what you would do in a carjacking, your default is cowardice and you won't do anything. Right. Um, but I have seen it. I've seen students who've come through my class who have been involved in violence and they have responded well and they've responded poorly. Exact same training, nothing changed. Um, exact same situations but different responses. Um, you know, it, it's a yeah. very interesting thing. It's a, we, after we had one of these recent shootings, uh, one of the clients asked me, you know, tell me that your bodyguards will do a better job than, you know, what this police officer did. Promise me, you know, and I said, look, 
I can't promise you what they'll do in a violent situation because I don't know. I don't know yeah. how they're going to react until they're there. I can tell exactly. you they're better trained to respond, you know, favorably than someone else because I know what training we've done for them. But, you know, and anyone they'll tell you, oh, I would do this in that situation. Yeah. You know, I, hey, that's great. Uh, go buy another round at the bar because that's all you're doing. <laughs> exactly. I, 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 especially in the age of social media where we can critique a video for, for weeks on end after the incident. And the, the thing that drives me nuts is the, the number of people who are putting themselves out there as professionals that will start their assessment with, I would have, it's like, yeah. you know what, it, it, as soon as you say those words, it indicates to me that you've never actually been there. Because everyone who, who has been there knows that they don't really know what they would have done. They know what they would like to have done or what their training says they should have done or what under best conditions, this is what I, I think I would have done. But you never say with certainty because you, you just know that you're, you're a fragile human being and you're, 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 you're sometimes a slave to the circumstances you're dealt. That's right. That's exactly right. I think probably you you make a good point too about not knowing what someone's capable of uh, in the moment because sometimes that works in our favor as well where someone we have you know, a lesser expectation of really steps up um, for a variety of reasons and uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll I'll use my wife as an example here she um, I, I never really thought of her as being uh, uh, I, I, before we had a, before we had an incident, I, I, I didn't think she would handle it very well because she'll she'll freak out over a spider or a cockroach or <laughs> like a, yeah a leak in the roof. And and then we had an incident where our uh, our second daughter had a seizure in the middle of the night, and uh, she was a uh, she was on the phone to to triple O our nine one one, and uh, I was there with all the advanced first aid training and the <laughs> the, the, the EMT training and, and and the crisis management training. And I was losing my, pl I was losing the plot a little bit. I was, I was doing all the things wrong. I was putting my fingers in her mouth and nearly getting my fingers bitten off because I was trying to keep her tongue down. And uh, I was, I was sacrificing myself. And my wife was an absolute rock star. She was uh, keeping it calm and she was talking very, very calmly and lucidly to the, emer to the uh, emergency operator. And I was just like, man, I, I really, uh, I really undersold her when, when, the <laughs> when it was real. She was, she was a rock star, and I was the one that was kind of holding on. Yeah, if it had been a stranger, you'd have done a lot better, probably. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I could. Yeah, plenty, plenty of opportunities where uh, where I can say uh, with a, with a stranger on the street, I can do much better. When it was my own kid, it was uh, especially at four a.m. when I was completely unprepared to deal with it. It's uh, it was different. And, and that's something really, really a good kind of segue, if you will, for for your listeners about about violence and and I, I, you know when I teach it, man. I, first of all, this is a very, very callous. Thing, okay because when I am talking about violence the only thing I care about is that you survive that's it that's all I care about I always tell people you know what I tell you might get you fired but at least you'll be alive um, and you may have to make some really difficult decisions like uh, there's an active shooter in your workplace and you have a choice between leaving by yourself or leaving and taking your you know your co-worker with you and she's refusing to leave I tell you right now leave her Right. And, and they look at me with these big eyeballs like I can't do that. I'm like, well, you're going to die with her then. And, and, you know, then they're like, oh, crap, because it's very callous. Right. Um, and, and the other thing is your priorities change. So, for instance, you know, I, I often talk about, you know, in, in the U.S., many of us are concealed carriers. Right. And, and I, I carry frequently. And I often talk about, you know, if I'm in that restaurant scenario and a guy walks in to rob the place and I feel you know, my life's in danger, I'm probably going to take him out. Um, but if I'm with my son, um, I'm not going to take the guy out. I'm going to take my son out the back door and we're going to get the hell out of there. And people will say, well, what changed? Well, my priorities just changed because my son is more important than I am. Right. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. It, but that, people that need to know that they, they need to know that. Right. Like when we go to church on Sundays, my wife knows if there's a shooting and grab the kids and start moving to the exit because I'm going right at the guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that that's why self-defense and, and these this scenario training with different layers of variables is so important. And, and I think that's, that's really what exposes the person who says, Oh, I would have done this because until you know, all the variables it's so hard to predict what was the right course of action. Uh, it's uh, you know, many years ago, I was teaching a self-defense seminar and it was uh, the audience were mostly Krav Maga practitioners. And, um, 
I, I sort of played out this scenario of a, a very typical road rage scenario in a car park of, you know, you stole, you, know, you stole a car park, et cetera, et cetera. Guy, a big guy gets out of the car and he starts threatening you and, and so on and so forth. And um, I asked the, asked the audience, what would you do? And nearly always the response was a physical response. You know, uh, yeah. Do it, drive uh, away. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, let's, let's assume you're out of the car. What are you going to do? And nearly always it was, well, I would do a, I do a web hand strike to the throat and yeah, 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 yeah. Like, okay, cool. Um, let's add a variable in. Now you've got your kids in the car that are watching the thing. Uh, what are you going to do now? Or, or now he's got his seven-year-old standing right next to him. Are you going to kill the kid's father in front of him and mm. traumatize that kid for life uh, just mm. because you feel like you're justified? Uh, are you still justified in doing long-term damage to somebody? Yeah, maybe you could have got away with a lethal force legally, maybe. But where are you at emotionally now with that decision? Uh, what are you going to do if you, yeah, and this is a, even, even the other end of the spectrum about, um, yeah, the running away from every situation. Are you going to run if you're a mother with who's pushing a pram with two kids in it? You're not going to be able to run. Are you going to leave your kids behind? <laughs> I mean, no, definitely not. Uh, every situation is different. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, uh, look, we're, we're, we're coming up on, uh, Close to, close to an hour, so I, I just thought I'd uh, we'll, we'll segue towards a towards a conclusion. Uh, is, is there anything in particular that that's a burning passion for you that, that you'd like to talk about, or a topic that, that you you want more people to be aware of that um, yeah, we can, we can uh, perhaps give some light to? Oh, I I just appreciate the you know the platform to help people to understand that they don't have to buy a special tool, right? I think one of the great things Mr. Cooper said to us, it's not in the color codes, but one of the things he said, and I like to say, is that safety is between your ears. It's not something you hold in your hand. Um, I, 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 can, I can do a lot of damage with, you know, a fire extinguisher or a hammer or, you know, you name it. I, it's just a tool to me. Um, my brain is the weapon. And, and I want people to remember that, A, they come from a, an ama they're, they're part of an amer amazing species. They got to be the you know, top of the food chain for a reason. And, and don't deny that, right? And, and then work on it, right? Like work on the physical, mental, and psychological part of this, you know, of living. And, and don't be, you know, kind of sucked into the modern world, if you will. Um, that, that's my biggest takeaway is I want people to feel empowered that they, you know, obviously there's time and place to call emergency services. That's fine. But I want you to save your own life when the boogeyman comes. Um, and, and that's, you know, obviously through a, a number of different ways. Um, but I just want them to be empowered and, and not feel as though they're just going to be victimized because they don't have to be a victim. They don't have to be a victim. Yeah. Look, I fully support that obviously with, you know, given the, given the platform of the show, but, uh, I think just to expand upon that as well, one of the things that uh, I see as a real challenge for us, and I think it's probably less of an issue in the US because you, you do have a different culture, but uh, I feel like over the last couple of generations here in Australia and in much of Europe, we've, seen, we've sought to disempower our civilians to, to wait for emergency response and to, to not, not get involved. You know, it's not, not your problem, don't get involved. Um, yeah. Hey, yeah. brother, that that just real quick that that th like, OK, if you well, now you got me, but <laughs> let's know, go. <laughs> when, when I teach active shooter, right, like in America, we, we put out uh, the run, hide, fight thing. The American yeah. government puts that out. I, I don't put that out. I, I'm not a huge fan of, of hiding. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of running and fighting and doing some other things. I'm not a big fan of getting underneath the table and hoping for the best but when you go to the uk in the uk they have run hide tell right they don't even have fight in I their know. thing yeah well, i thank god every, I thank god every day tell. the two guys on the bridge recently with one with the fire extinguisher and one with the tusk i thank god they didn't you know listen to that guidance i thank god they got involved right i, I don't i don't i don't particularly care for that at all yeah, I mean, ours is escape, hide, tell. So very, very similar to the UK model. And, wow. uh, and they've, they've just re-released a, a new standard. The, the original one had, uh, if, you, if you dive deeper beyond the three words, each element had a, you may have to fight to be able to escape. You may have to fight to be able to hide. You may have to fight to be able to tell. Uh, so there was, a, there was an element of fight in there, and now that's been removed as well. And I think that 
it's so it's like we become so scared of the the litigious um, consequences of encouraging people to fight that we've actually removed people's sovereignty of their own safety, uh, and I and I, and I think that is, is is such a concern because our emergency services can't be everywhere, uh, and even in our highly populated areas where we now have counterterrorism teams that are literally have a two minute response time to most areas of the of most metropolitan uh, CBDs, still. Two minutes is a, is a long time when someone's actively shooting someone or stabbing someone or, or detonating an explosive. Uh, and I think uh, the more we train people to know, yeah, you know what? You don't have to be a black belt. You don't have to be a SWAT team operator. You don't have to be ex-military to be able to do something. Uh, and you know, as we saw, I mean, we, we had uh, in London, a guy with a fire extinguisher and a guy with a freaking narwhal tusk. I mean... I, I have concerns about why he had an hour task with him, but I'm glad he did. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like you, I, I had to look up what that actually was. Um, yeah, me too. I Googled it too. I was like, okay, wow. That's a, it's an interesting improvised weapon. I've never considered using before, but good for him. Um, I think it's really yeah. concerning if we get to a point where, where governments tell a, an individual that a basic human right is not the right to defend oneself. I think that's a terrifying place to be. Uh, you know, I, I don't, how can you, that's like a fundamental right that I have the ability to defend my own, my safety. That's scary, bro. Yeah, it, it really is. And I think it's, um, it, it filters down through all levels. I mean, once it, once the government starts being scared of it, then, then corporations will, will start having like nearly every security company that I'll, that I'll train will have a, uh, what they call a hands-off policy, where yeah. even their security personnel are not supposed to touch anybody. And so, well, that kind of is, is complete. Uh, you, you completely oblivious then to the actual risk of of, uh, of what you're asking people to do. If you if you're uh, asking your security personnel to arrest somebody, how are you going to arrest someone without touching them if they don't want to be arrested? <laughs> I mean, that's it's it's ridiculous. Uh, and, and unfortunately, what it does is it creates indecision uh, in, in the moment where someone has to concern themselves with what 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 takes priority my my basic human right to defend myself or the HR policies I signed when I when I joined the company. Uh, it's uh, yeah, scares me. Yeah. Scares me. Yeah, and look, I, I previously um, managed uh, an armed security team. Uh, for a private organization uh, here in Australia, which is quite rare. Uh, and I had, I had a good team of, of um, very, very well-trained armed, uh, armed operatives that I was, uh, I, I had control over and, and we had a, a mandatory training uh, come in and uh, it was about workplace health and safety law and put, not putting yourself in harm's way. And basically the, the, the gist of the presentation was if you put yourself in harm's way, knowingly you can be charged with a violation of, health and safety legislation. And I'm looking at a bunch of armed guards who, whose primary role is protecting uh, the people in this, uh, this organization against armed shooters, uh, against uh, active armed defenders and, uh, and active shooters. And like, there, there's no way that you were gonna take that shot without putting yourself in harm's way. Like that's, uh, and unfortunately all that presentation did was create indecision amongst the operators to now say, well, if I do what I believe is right and what I've trained to do, then am I, opening myself up for litigation against me because I put myself in harm's way to take that shot. Uh, and it's, I, I found the whole thing completely counterproductive. And in fact, it was made it more likely one of my guys was going to get shot because he was going to hesitate. Yeah. 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 That's, that's American law enforcement right now. I mean, that's 2019 American law enforcement is the litigation and the, it, all of it. I mean, that, you, you can't tell me there's not a relationship between the amount of litigation and jailings of police officers and the suicide rate you can't tell me that they're, they're not related you just can't oh absolutely yeah absolutely and I, I think it's as with as with nearly everything the the truth is in the gray area there's a there's a balance that has to be struck but um yeah finding that balance unfortunately is going to have casualties on both sides uh, That's true. before we before we get it right well, thank you, brother. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, is there is there anything you want to uh, leave us with, or if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to, to reach you to if they want you to speak or, or want to pick your brain? Yeah, um, on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn, James uh, Hamilton, and uh, email is uh, James Hamilton at gdba .com. Um, Feel free to email, reach out. Um, we do have uh, we do have some some presence down there in Australia as well, so. 
uh, I'd, I'd love to connect with anyone um, on those platforms and uh, just, you know, keep being safe. You know? Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, James. I do appreciate you making time in your schedule and, uh, and, and picking a time that, that worked for me at a relatively sociable hour <laughs> here in Melbourne, thanks Australia. <laughs> so thanks very much. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Me too. Thanks for having me, Joe. Cheers. Thank you once again to James Hamilton from Gavin De Becker and Associates for freeing up his time and uh, sharing some knowledge with us here on the Managing Violence podcast. As I said, it was a great, fun opportunity for me and also a little bit of a bucket list item for me to um, be able to talk to someone who works for Gavin De Becker and Associates when it was uh, Gavin De Becker's work that really uh, was one of the one of the first texts that really sparked a fire in me to, to do this work. So uh, that, that was a, a lot of fun for me. If you want to know more about James, as he said, he's on LinkedIn. If you want to know more about Gavin DeBecker and Associates, head over to www.gdba.com. That's Golf Delta Bravo Alpha.com for Gavin DeBecker and Associates. Thanks again to James. Uh, we'll be back again with another episode very, very soon. Until then, stay safe. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Managing Violence Podcast. For more information or to listen to previous episodes, please check out www.josaunders.com.au or visit us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Don't forget to rate and subscribe so you never miss a show.